Seahawks fans, wherever you may be. Thanks for listening to the show. Join your hosts, Bill Alpstead and Keith Myers, as we talk Seahawks football. Hey, hi, Seahawks fans. Welcome back to another episode of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Alpstead, sitting down with co-host Keith Myers here to talk Seahawks football. We're going to do our second part of our roster evaluations post-free agency, uh, focusing on the defensive side of the ball in today's show. Welcome in, Keith. How you doing? Doing good. Nice. Long time no see. Yeah, it's been a couple of hours. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we recorded uh, episode one of our um, roster evaluation. Kind of split these things in half since we got long-winded on our offensive side. So we're doing the defense. You and I are long-winded? Never. I know, crazy. One of the things that did pop up uh, <laughs> since the last time we saw each other a couple of hours ago is uh, Seahawks brought in a um, offensive guard to take a look at Greg Van Roten, spent some time with the Las Vegas Raiders as their starting right guard um, all 17 games last season. Pretty decent rating on Pro Football Focus, uh, 75.3. That ranked sixth overall for offensive guards in the NFL. Um, anyway, just another guy, uh, to take a look at before they get to the draft potentially, or a guy they want to sign after the draft concludes. Um, so now we're focusing on the defensive side. You had mentioned the the last show that, um, I think you felt a little better about the offense before we headed into free agency. And then after free agency, you kind of reevaluated that and not feeling so good and you looked at the defensive side after the moves they made in free agency feel a lot better about the defense you're on mute Keith. i do feel better about the defense they um let's try this one more time there um i i do feel better about the defense they did a um they did a good job of addressing the concerns that they had signing um, guys, filling out roster spots. They've shifted the roster in quite, quite a bit uh, moved their investment away from safety and linebacker and shifted it towards the, the line um, kind of where it should be. Um, they got faster. Uh, they got better in coverage and those safety and linebacker spots, even if they've gotten overall, um, less talented at those spots they've shifted it in more of a direction where they um feel is more scheme diverse and a better fit for what they want to do and i don't know i i I, yeah for me i I mean that makes it hate the moves they might not be as individually as talented but i think as a group they potentially have the opportunity to be a better unit overall Mm -hmm. Well, and the work, problem that the Seahawks better. have had the last few years, besides getting progressively worse against the run, they've haven't been able to get off the field on third down for quite some time. And the schematic changes that they've made, and then the personnel changes, getting better at um, coverage in the middle of the field, should go a long way towards alleviating that problem. Agreed. Absolutely. One of my favorite uh, signings... Um, of the off season was the Jonathan Hankins signing. Now I know he's uh, been around a little bit. He's probably now uh, declining as a player overall, but still for what he is asked to do, he does well. And that's take on double teams and stuff the run. And uh, he's, so he's only going to be on the field uh, first or second down primarily come off on third downs. You got Cameron young in there. Matt Gattel is, is another uh, guy at the nose tackle spot. Um, I would imagine that there is room on this roster for another guy, um, in, in the draft, if the draft falls a certain way, I know that they're bringing in, um, guys they like, I know one of the guys they are bringing in, uh, for their 30 visit is Christian Boyd, the defensive tackle from Northern Iowa. I really like in the draft and kind of the fourth to fifth round range where Seattle does have uh, a pick or two. And, um, 
I would expect them almost to kind of add to this only because I think it's really something that Mike McDonald likes to have on his defense is a, a few different defensive tackles um, that weigh about 200 or 330 pounds or so. And um, right now we've got Hankins and then that's it. Now go tell uh, is listed um, at uh, 341. Really? Yeah. Okay. So that, that surprises me a little bit. I thought he was closer to 320. I think and Cameron then, Young came into camp yes, last year. I think he got up to about 308, but they were going to have him try to get up to 320, something like that. Yeah. He was drafted at 304, came up. Um, they, they, they expect him to come into camp about 320, um, which puts him a little on the light side for uh, what Seattle does with, um, or what or Seattle, what um, McDonald does with their nose tackle, but it's still, he's still a big guy. And, yeah, and play yeah. is like a nose tackle. So, um, yeah, it kind of puts gives you f- the athletic upside. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, I like, I mean, last year they went into the year with none. Um, I mean, Brian Monet was the only one on the roster and he right. was recovering from a knee injury and never played and never was actually expected to play. And um, Ron Reed was, was hired in free agency and was told, you know, up front that he was going to play nose tackle. By Pete yeah. Carroll and just kind of just out of position and you it's know, not who he, he harkened is. back to the idea that in his old four three days, Jaron Reed played nose tackle in, in as part of a twosome, you know, in, in the middle there. And it's just really different it in a three, three four. T- it was a three tech, you know. Yeah. And he's been a three tech, he was always a three tech. Anytime he's been asked to do more than that, whether it's slide out to the five or whether it's slide into the zero or whatever. He hasn't been as good, and mm-hmm. um, and I think the team suffered for it. And then we just really didn't have a, a run stuffing presence last year. The def- the defense just got run over many many times. Yep. And some of it was so, some of that was um, the lack of a nose tackle, um, and some of it honestly was just poor play calling and. Um, yeah, just a lot of a lot of misuse of the talent that was there. Um, but yeah, so they went from having no nose tackles on the roster to having three uh, this offseason, which I like. I like the fact that they've they've uh, shifted schematically into uh, a system where they're gonna have they have the right bodies. Um, yes. We've got those three guys that will uh, most it'll mostly be. Um, Hankins and Young, but you've got Gutel as, as depth if you need it at the nose. And at the two defensive end spots, you've got, um, you know, Williams, Jerron Reed, and Dre Jones in a three man rotation. Uh, and who knows, maybe we'll get to see more of, uh, Mike Morris this year. Last year looked like he was going to have a, uh, a good role, big role, and then got hurt. And we didn't see much of him. Um, and then yeah, Miles the- Adams is still around, but I wonder for how much longer. And then Latrell Bumpus is in there too. So, you know, I kind of mix up the, the three techs and the base defensive ends that Seattle's got on their roster because they are kind of multiple. They do move around a little bit. Mm-hmm. Jerron Reed will be asked to kick out. Draymond Jones, definitely. Leonard Williams is always going to be a guy that's going to be a three and a five. Miles Adams, same sort of thing. So, And Mike Morris, they asked him to, to put on a bit of weight, I imagine. He'll get some time at the three tech as well. And so that position seems to be taken care of like it would yeah. surprise it surprised me the, the one kid that's been linked at least on uh, mock drafts a lot is byron murphy the kid out of texas you know which essentially plays jaron reed's spot draymond jones's spot leonard williams's spot mike morris's spot so i'm not sure if they go and and get that guy or not it, i don't I know that kind of disappeared when they when they re-signed leonard williams i think he have everyone had him linked to Seattle because without Leonard Williams on the roster to be the dominant um, person in that rotation, they didn't have one. So the idea was that, Oh, well, they'll, they'll spend that 16th pick to go get that dominant uh, three tech. Now they've got it. And they've got two other guys that are good in that rotation with them. I think they're probably, uh, I mean, obviously 
they're all you're always looking to add uh, talent on your defensive line, but it is not the need that it was coming into free agency. Right. I think it's it's more likely that Seattle tries to figure out a, how to get in a position to draft uh, Trevante uh, Sweat, um, mm-hmm. Byron Murphy's teammate there at, um, at Texas. Yeah, the 360-pound um, nose tackle. Yeah. Because that makes Hankins, who's uh, near the end of his career, and Gotell, who's never been um, a- athletic for that size. He's just big. Um, both push down far enough on the depth chart that they might not make the depth chart. Um, but yeah, overall, I mean, this uh, is a... It, the defensive line is in a much better spot now than it was when free agency started. And it's part of why mm-hmm. I am, I feel better about the defense than I did. Interesting. The other names that might pop up are Mason Smith and Jordan Jefferson, the two defensive tackles from LSU in the draft, uh, both big guys um, that, that could handle those sorts of duties. Dermontre Capehart, from Clemson's 320 pounds already talked about. Um, oh, what was the kid that I just mentioned? Trevon day sweat. No, the, the guy we brought in on a 30 visit here, Christian Boyd. Is another oh yeah. Guy in Northern, Northern Iowa. Um, I would think that those guys are going to be on their radar as far as um, guys that they would take a look at. Now, if a three tech in the draft just prevent, uh, looks like tremendous value, I don't think that prevents them from drafting one, just like Not we talked all. about with, you know, some of the other position groups, a wide receiver in particular. I think we were talking about that. Um, but it remains to be seen. Like like right now, we've only got seven draft picks and only two in the top 100. So if you're looking for a guy like that just to to, to fill in or back end kind of talent, um, you're going to look in the later rounds. Well, if a guy like – if they decide that a guy like Byron Murphy is – um, too good to pass up on. You may see Jerron Reed or Dre Jones traded away. Um, yes. You know, during day two or day three of the draft to get an extra draft pick there because you just upgraded, got younger, got cheaper, um, and now you don't need one of those guys. So you'll send them off to a new team and um, get some extra draft capital that way. All right, let's continue to look at the rest of the roster. Let's talk about three, four outside linebackers, edge rushers, mm-hmm. however you want to describe those guys, Keith. How, um, what kind of a condition is this roster? It's actually in pretty good shape. I mean, uh, Uchina Nuwasu is supposed to be back, um, and that's going to be a big deal. Losing him really hurt last year, and uh, Boye Mafe was the breakout player last year. The two of them will come in as the starters, you got Derek Hall. They're hoping to take a Boye Mafe like jump in year two. Um, and then Daryl Taylor, who's back for uh, another year, which is a little surprising that, you know, they, they re signed him and brought him back, uh, given that he's kind of a, he's a pass rusher. He's not a, truly an outside linebacker and his ability to do all the different things. I thought he would move on to a, a 4 3 defense. Um, Go with the little belongs. guarantees in there. He's more of a draft hedge than almost anything else at this point. Yeah. Um, but he's also cheap enough that and you can never have enough pass rushers. Um, he's got a chance. Um, and then they've got, you know, Levi Bell, um and who is kind of an enigma because, you know, he's older and smaller, but you know, you saw him play in the preseason at in camp. He's he gets the job done. He's, he's productive. So, um, and then Joshua, Unu, Unu Giago, um, is a guy that we just don't know much about. Um, uh, he's kind of was here on the futures contract and, yeah. and, um, we'll see what, what, what they have in him and camp, but it's a pretty good group overall. If that, if you include Daryl Taylor, um, you, you're four deep there, which gives you your starters and your backups. And then you've got a couple of guys that are, you know, depth and, and roster filler if you need them, or maybe they, you know, practice squad guys. So um, it's not a bad group at all. I, I, I do think they add a body uh, to that because, like I said, you can never have enough pass rushers. Um, 
And with Nuasu's injury and the fact that you know that Daryl Taylor is not an every down player should, um, you know, somebody get hurt, you're really limiting yourself um, in terms of the overall depth. So I could see them bring in one more guy uh, in this draft, but it's definitely not a need. It's not a need like it has been in, in many years in the past. It is, it is kind of crazy, though, because if there's a, a couple of different players that could drop, depending on how they view them, guys like Jared Verse um, or, or the kid from UCLA, Latu, or mm-hmm. Dallas Turner or Chop Robinson, they may even you know drop in the draft a little bit, get into the 20s, and guys like Darius Robinson, Chris Braswell, might be attractive at that point if a guy like Chop Robinson were to, to fall and, and be there at the 20 to 20 five range um yeah if they drop from be from 16 down to like 22 and then you have chop robinson just sitting there that would be really hard to uh, pass on i agree and and so you kind of uh replace him on the roster you know get daryl taylor off and and add a guy like chop robinson and your top four uh, edge rushers on this team are actually really formidable and young yep. for the most part Except well, yeah, and then we, the truth is that we don't know what we have in Derek Hall. I mean, like I said, we we hope that he makes that Boye Mafe type jump um, between year one and year two, but we don't know if he will. Or it's just a different type of player, though. You know, yeah. Boye Mafe is just really explosive. I mean, if there's a player in the draft that's kind of like Boye Mafe, it'd be Chop Robinson. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Derek Maybe Hall's Dallas got that Turner got too. speed. Like he's got crazy speed for the position. Which is actually why coming into this offseason, um, I wouldn't have been shocked if they had announced they were moving Hall to inside linebacker. He's a little small for it, but man, the guy's rangy. Um, He's rangy, but he doesn't have the length. And so, you know, you get it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, he may be an off the ball kind of linebacker. I'm not so sure. I, you know, he's a good tackler. He's fundamentally good. He's got the heart and the grit and all that kind of stuff, but. I didn't see enough of him last year in a pass rushing role. They they seemed to have him in on on you know set, trying to set the edge and playing the run, and I think he got swallowed up a little bit in that role. Um, I'll be interested to see how he does in the weight room this year and kind of come back in full off season program and see where he's at. Yeah. So one of the positions that they had a complete wholesale change on this off season was at linebacker Keith. Mm-hmm. Um, inside linebacker yeah bobby with wagner and with the new yeah bobby wagner um is one of the greatest that ever put a helmet on um but his his day, good days are are long gone um still the locker room presence still um you know an awesome awesome guy and and makes a lot of tackles but he does not run um well very little around like he used to and he was an absolute liability in coverage. They went ahead and let him go rejoin with um, Dan Quinn, uh, now with um, Washington. And then Brooks ended up uh, leaving and going to Miami and signing a, a pretty big deal um, there. And so with both those guys gone, both those guys were um, good against the run, um, but not in in coverage. And they went the opposite direction um, with the guys they signed uh, getting uh, Jerome Baker and uh, Tyrell Dodson, who are both um, good in coverage, but not the thumpers, not the guys that come up and make all the plays uh, against the run the way that Brooks and um, Wagner did. So um, tactical shift in terms of what they, are we're looking for at that position this year. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I talk, Terrell Dodson, uh, I think is going to be the primary middle linebacker, uh, Jerome Baker, they view as kind of a weak side guy. still going to be, you know, off the ball in the middle of the defense, but, uh, dropping back into coverage, uh, quite a bit. He's, he's actually really good at that, but there's room there. And those are both on one year deals. Um, there's room there to draft a guy. Um, oh, and yeah. kind of to groom them. Now, John Radigan has got that third spot as far as depth chart is concerned. Patrick O'Connell, Drake Thomas are going to have a chance to compete in training camp, probably end up on the practice squad. Um, John Radigan's kind of a staple uh, as far as special teams is concerned, but, but a new regime, a new special teams coach, 
who knows where John Rattigan's going to fall on, on that, especially if they draft a guy. If we happen to draft, you know, we're moving around a little bit, we pick up an extra pick, maybe it's a late second round pick, we draft a middle linebacker um, to come in and, and play and compete right away, maybe even compete against Dodson for, for a starting spot, you know, after a few games. Mm-hmm. Um, John Rattigan's spot on the roster might be in jeopardy. Yeah, and that's actually what I am am kind of expecting. Um, Junior Colston out of Michigan uh, comes to mind, although I don't know if he's quite as fast as um, the team hoped that he would be. Uh, um, But a guy like um, Peyton Wilson um, Mm. would be the type of player that if he's, you know, there, let's say they move, they, they move back and they end up with a pick in like, um, you know, the mid fifties and he's sitting there. I just could see them jumping on that, um, you know, very quickly or, mm-hmm. you know, later in the round, maybe someone like Tyron Hopper, um, a little smaller, but got, um, yeah. you know, got the long arms and the fluid hips and it's good, in, good in coverage. And, and I, yes. I would be fairly surprised if they don't come out of this draft without a, middle linebacker someone that even if they don't start in year one they project as a starter in year two um i agree and there's and there's a it's a good draft to do that it's a good draft to pick up a guy in the fourth to sixth round and and allow them to develop make special you know be on special teams um in the same kind of prototype as terrell dodson and jerome baker now, if you're looking for a true middle linebacker, old school tackling machine kind of guy, you know, 240 pounds, six one, six two, runs a four five, forty. Yeah, there's a handful of those players in this draft. A couple of them up up near the top, but um, I don't think that they're they're looking for those guys anymore. I think they really want this kind of scheme diversity. Drop back into coverage. Yeah, they're going to come up and make plays. They're also going to get help by true defensive tackles in this scheme now and so um they can they can make plays going forward a little easier and not have to kind of go through traffic to to make plays trail dodson does a much better job when he's uh has agility and goes sideline to sideline and, and so and fills holes fills gaps um so it'll be interesting yeah um guy that i like but don't think is a is the scheme fit that um, will really work in this. You're talking about old school linebackers would be like Tommy Eichenberg out of mm-hmm. Ohio state. Um, you know, not the fleetest of foot, not the greatest in, in coverage, but man, he comes up, um, makes a lot of tackles and, and just hits people hard, uh, coming forward and I like that kind of player, but I'm not sure if that's what, uh, this team is looking for given, you know, what they've done with the middle linebacker spot in free yep. agency. Yeah. And I, you know, another player, and in fact, a 30 visit was Trice Knight, the UTEP linebacker, mm-hmm. six foot, 233 pounds. So you're thinking, is that guy a, a linebacker? Is he a big, you know, strong safety? Well, yeah. Right. And so he's, he runs a four, six, three forty. It's not extremely uh, fast, but the guy's a good athlete can move around in space, drops back into coverage. Um, had a good 10 yard split at one five, four, which is pretty elite for that size. Got a great wingspan at 80 and a half inches, um, that sort of thing. And, um, really good in coverage for the most part, come up and blitz, good blitzing type of, uh, linebacker McDonald talked about how that's going to, um, be important, um, at, from the safety spot and linebacker spot to build a blitz and, and stunt and so forth. So, um, so it wouldn't surprise me if that guy's, you know, on a card turned in in the fifth, sixth round, uh, for sure. I don't think we have a fifth round pick, but um, if he's if he's there in the sixth Not round, at that'd this be great point. value. So safeties, Keith, um, where are we at with our safeties on our current roster? Well, um, gone are the two excruciatingly overpriced. Um, <laughs> Uh, Jamal Adams and um, Diggs, um, both of which not only were they way overpriced, but they were neither, neither one of them was good in by any sense of the imagination last year. Um, and the team had to move on. 
had to go and fix the fact that they were spending 40 million of their cap on bad players in at a, a non-premium position. Um, and so yeah, they did, they, they fixed that too late, but at, at least a year too late with, um, Jamal Adams, but whatever, they finally did it. Um, Julian Love is back. He's got that, uh, ability to be multiple play up in the box or back or get slide over into coverage. Um, he's the type of guy that McDonald loves. Guy. Yeah. yeah. And with him is Rashawn Jenkins. He's going to be the starter, technically the starter at free safety. Um, I believe. And he is also, um, a guy that can do a lot of stuff. He's very multiple. Um, his ability to play in the box, to play the deep third, to, to slide in and, and cover in the slot, um, one-on-one, just a very, um, versatile guy to go with love, uh, gives, gives McDonald exactly what he needs, which is a bunch of guys that can do that because he yeah. wants to disguise everything he does. That's the perfect talent level at the perfect price price for a roster like yeah in the nfl it's it's balanced they're not spending too much you know combined total if you include Kayvon wallace who they picked up in free agency and jerick reed colby bryant all those guys are gonna be making you know around 10 million dollars uh you know 12 million dollars combined combined total and that's kind of where you want to be spending your money that's might even be high on the on the league side of things uh but they do value their safeties um and and you look at these guys in the similar way that you looked at the two linebackers that we just talked about you know at the the top of the linebacker room tyrell dodson and jerome baker great in coverage uh they can come up and hit you sure tackling that's what you're getting out of rashawn jenkins and julian love as well pretty decent tacklers they can play in coverage julian love came in struggled a little bit i think part of that was just coaching and scheme kind of crap going on Eventually, Julian Love settled into his role and played pretty well down the stretch uh, for Seattle. I think fans should be excited about that because I think Jenkins and Love are a really nice little combo. Mm -hmm. And then anything else you add to that, uh, whatever you can get out of Kevon Wallace, um, and then if Jerry Reed can come back, you know, in the first, uh, you know, even after week eight, if, if that were the case. What do you do with Kobe Bryant, though? McDonald says we'll figure out where Kobe feels most comfortable at and when he's playing his best football for us and then we'll go let him compete earn himself a significant role you know that's that's what mcdonald said about kobe bryant we've all been saying the same thing about kobe bryant for the last couple of seasons like where does he fit what does he do is he part of the safety room is he part of the cornerback room do you just call him a defensive back and you just kind of move him around a little bit i think that's yeah. part of the problem for kobe bryant is you just you've been kind of moving him around so much he doesn't have a home well, he doesn't have a home, but at the same time, I think that um, that in a Mike McDonald defense, that can play, you know, that can be a strength um, because you can have him be out there. He can play free safety. Um, he doesn't tackle that well, so you got to be careful with him coming up into the box, but he can play in the slot. He can play on the outside. He can play in the back. You can move him around and do a bunch of different things. Um, and I think that's going to be his biggest asset is the fact that just because he's on the field doesn't mean, oh, we can, we can, uh, assume he's doing, you know, a certain thing, um, because they can move him around, have him, um, he can be the reason why you have a corner blitz coming because, uh, yeah, he's lined up at safety, but you can use him as a cornerback, um, on that play and, and have him slide out into that zone and, and do those kind of things, um, I wish he tackled better. Uh, I wish he, he covered better. <laughs> I yeah. mean, in coverage last year, he was he had a 92.9% completion rate against him yeah. as a, and a passer rating of 100. And it wasn't that. Those were actually slight, uh, slightly worse than the year prior to that. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I don't know. I, don't, I, I just don't know. I, I agree with you, though, in that. He's got talent. I think they this, just figure it out. Yeah, I think this defensive staff is going to give him the best opportunity to find his niche in, in the NFL and figure out how to help this team. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause if he can't, and he, he just doesn't really emerge out of training camp, he's, they might hold on to him cause he's so inexpensive and Jer- uh, Jarek Reed might not be ready to come back. But if Jarek Reed comes back, Kevon Wallace kind of shows they draft a kid, it'll be Bryant's jobs on the line. 
True. And that I think that's why, because last year they listed him, they, they switched and listed him at safety. Um, and now they're back to listing him at cornerback. Um, Are they really? Yeah. That might not mean anything right now. It doesn't mean anything right now, but um, I just look at it and I just go, okay, because you've got, um, you know, you've got Love, Jenkins, um, and Wallace, and then, and Reed, if he's healthy. But, you know, it's also Jonathan Sutherland, who, mm-hmm. um, totally he, different player, though, than Kobe Bryant. Yeah. But I'm just saying, like, you've got uh, uh, not only guys, but talent at the position. Um, Kobe Bryant's going to have a hard time getting on the field. Um, if, he's, if they draft if, the if guy, he's I think it's over. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of. Unless, but, you know, that they listed him at cornerback. But now, cornerback's got its own problems, and we'll get there here in a sec. But, um, <laughs> well, there's no room. Yeah. Yeah. I but, mean, so the defensive backfield overall as a whole is, it's pretty loaded for the Seahawks. And I'm really looking forward to seeing Jonathan Sutherland in, in training camp um, mm-hmm. and in preseason. But, does he fit the mold of what Mike McDonald's looking for in his scheme diverse groups? I don't know. Um, I know that he plays up in, in the box and does a lot of good things there, but he's also I got, can't remember how he is in cover. He's also got, but he's got a ton of speed. Now he's a, was more of a work in progress on the back end, but that was when you were expecting him to be a single high safety. And he's not really, um, he's never really done that. Um, but McDonald doesn't do as much single high safety stuff. He does a lot of um, cover two and, um, you know, or, or cover six, which is like cover two on one side and cover three on the other. Um, and, you know, a lot of stuff like that, where I think Sutherland's speed can really be an asset. So um, does that, that mean that they will end up keeping one more safety and corner and one less linebacker on this roster. Probably one, one, one more defensive back, one less linebacker. Um, just so kind of essentially the way they've been playing. The last yeah. Few years. Which is a little weird. I mean, a, a lot of teams would do that when they're playing a four, three, um, because you keep the guys that are better on special teams because the defensive backs tend to be faster. Um, where, but when a three, four, you kind of need your linebackers. Um, and so typically right. you're, you're going to, you're going to go, if you're going to go light, it's going to be on the defensive line. Cause you're only playing three at a time, but I don't know. I don't know what this team's going to do um, with this coaching staff, but I just look at, at their, like their safety depth. It's pretty good. And we didn't, it's you know, pretty good. It is pretty good. It is. So, I feel good about it. I mean, I, I didn't feel good about it as soon as we jettisoned the two guys that took up 90% of the snaps last year, but um, they solved it. They saw, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't feel any worse after they jettisoned the guys than before. In fact, I f- kind of felt better. <laughs> well, I was hopeful that they would fill them with guys that we got. No, Devon not Wallace, even Rashawn Jenkins. I thought that that's a pretty decent replacement level. Um, Diggs did was diminished last year. You can say what you want about um, Adams, but he was so um, bad. Yeah, but to have Rashawn Jenkins and, and Julian Love and Wallace there, I feel like they're better. Said, I feel good about it. I, I, they're the names aren't as big, but they're better. And a, a lot of that had to do with this. Jamal Adams just genuinely was not a good football player last year, and I know a lot of that has to do with his, the injury. And it's not. I'm not trying to to criticize him, you know, personally or anything like that, because I know he was trying to be out there and play and and um, push through a really bad injury. But but there's a reason uh, why he's still out there. Yeah, um, you can pr- you can re- replace his production with an undrafted free agent, seemingly. And, and so to get to get uh, a guy like Rashawn Jenkins in there as that replacement, you're like, okay, that's a significant upgrade. So let's turn our attention to what I think is probably the highest quality, talent wise mm-hmm. position group on this team. The cornerbacks. Yeah, I would agree with that. Cornerback with, um, you know, it starts with with Devin Witherspoon last year's um, tremendous rookie season. Oh man, just a tremendous rookie season. Yeah. Um, maybe the best defensive player on Seattle's entire roster as yes. a rookie at cornerback. As of, right, just, as of right now, absolutely. 
Uh, obviously, it just at, over the course of last season. Um, and just tremendous player in coverage and run stuffing and blitzing. And they asked him to do so many different things, and he did all of them at a high level. Um, opposite him is obviously Tariq Woolen. Um, you know, the the wonder kid from a year earlier had a, you know, a sophomore slump, if you will. There's a lot of stuff going on with that. I think some of it had to do with injury. Some of it had to do with not trusting a coaching staff um, that honestly didn't necessarily deserve the trust. Um, but the guy can physically, the guy can just flat out play. Um, probably I the best I, you young know, of corners in the NFL. I got corrected on YouTube uh, a week or two ago by um, by a guy who said that Tariq Woolen ran a four two seven forty or four two eight forty, and I was thinking I thought he ran a four three three. I sure as enough, I went back and he ran that four two seven. I think that's yeah, the combine. he yeah, was so he's, elite he's got speed. Wheels. And not, and he's not a straight, just a straight line guy. He's big. He is um, fast. He's um, he's a ball hawk too. He knows yeah. how to play the ball. Yeah. I don't he's know what a, happened last year. I really, I, I don't. I think he lost some confidence, and that injury really kind of, I think, mm-hmm. hampered him the first five or six weeks. And he never really completely came back. And of course, the yeah, he, stuff, you never know what's going on there. Yeah, he. I mean, he he is an elite player, and and I'm excited to see what he does. Um, uh, in this system. Um, I, I agree. But him opposite Witherspoon is like, like I said, I think that's the best young cornerback tandem at the NFL. Well, um, yes, potentially. I'll add that. Okay. I mean, the way Willen played last year, I got to see it. I got to see him in his rookie season. I got to see that player back. And then I would totally agree with you. Um, And then behind those two, you get Trey Brown who started a bunch of games he can play the slot. He can play outside. I think outside. he's fringy pro, pro Bowl level. He, yeah, honestly, he's he's. I mean, fringy is is the right thing. I think he's just off, but he's right in there. Um, you go back to his rookie year. I had really low expectations for him. Yeah, you did. Uh, and you said he, he was way too handsy in college. He w- go watch his tape in college. He he committed what would have been pass interference in the NFL on every single play, um, but he adjusted he stayed physical but you know um did so in a way that was no longer uh getting flags uh really uh developed into a nice player and before his injury um then he was out for a while then he came back and he came back at a high level there too um so they've got three guys that are young talented good um that's it's that's an incredible depth that teams just don't and you, you know one of those guys will play in the slot when that guy isn't playing in the slot it was going to be jerick reed or it was going to be kobe bryant um julian mm-hmm. love can actually also play in in the slot as well so they and then Artie burns uh, had a lot of um nickel coverage as well so they've got a lot of guys that can play multiple different spots with exactly what mike mcdonald wants out of his mm-hmm. defensive backs Artie burns so keeps coming back <laughs> right. um and he I played know, last year, though. So he did year, play last year. The year before, he he sat on the bench almost. I think he had like three snaps, defensive yeah. snaps, the entire season. Last year was a little different. I'm so surprised when he came back after that first year. And I know that you know they had him, it kind of expecting him to be a starter. But then Tariq Woolen happened. Okay, and then it, you know it just never worked out for him. Kobe Bryant came back from injury pushed him down the depth chart even further and and he never saw the field. I was shocked when he came back. Not that the team wouldn't want him back because he's a, he's a good player, but that he would be willing to come back to that situation where he didn't play. Um but he did. He got a chance to play. He played quite a bit last year and um showed why he was at one point a first round pick. Um and yeah. uh I mean when he's your fourth best corner on your roster or fifth or who'd be the fourth mike jackson oh uh that's true um i'm mike jackson's not on my list because i don't think he signed his restricted free agent tender so he's not technically on the roster um mm, i don't know that for sure but yeah he's I on dot, he's on dot com's roster 
Okay. So, so I, I put them on my, and they've updated the roster. So I, yeah, I Mike they, Jackson is, um, <laughs> I mean, he was a starter two years ago, uh, opposite, um, Wollen. you know, um, Tariq Woolen and played really well, mm -hmm. very physical, um, comes up to the line of scrimmage and, and, and plays the run as good as any cornerback you'll see. Um, big guy, um, you know, not the fastest guy, uh, much better in, in zone coverage and then in man and, and, you know, because of that, but there's a lot to like about him. And there was a reason why when they decided to bench Woolen because of failed, uh, responsibilities and they started Jackson, the defense looked better. That's got better. He's not, he's not as physically talented as Woolen, but he plays, his, he does his job and he's, he's such a physical guy. Yeah. He's a good he's player disciplined too. Yeah. You know, you, you'd mentioned Artie Burns. Well, if he's your fourth guy, you got a pretty decent secondary, but he might be Artie your, Burns fifth guy. Is your fifth guy. And you got a really decent secondary because uh, you know, they don't have to do a thing uh, mm -hmm. in the draft and this room would be complete and ready to go. Uh, anything yeah. that they do is either going to have to sit one of those guys we just talked about or they're cut um, mm -hmm. or they're coming out of the practice squad or whatever, you know, Lance Boykin, Andrew Whitaker, they do not have a shot at penetrating that um, lineup this, this year. Those are going to be practice squad guys. If they, if they make the, the, the team that way at all. Mm -hmm. And then anybody that we pick up in the draft or undrafted rookie free agents is going to have to break through that group and you know you could argue you make an argument for a young kid with a lot of upside that that could bump Artie burns off the roster but beyond that i'm not so sure i think mike jackson would be the guy um really well he's in he's a he's a he's a restricted free agent this year which means an unrestricted at the after this season um and if i was I'll, another team and i was looking for a decent press corner or or, a, or even a uh, nickel guy that could come in and be, be scheme diverse. I'd flip a pick for Mike Jackson. I'd oh, give hell you a yeah, I would too. Round pick. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking, yeah. Uh, fifth or sixth. I mean, you, you, he's not going to cost you that much and you know, you're getting a player. Yeah. Like you're, you're yeah, getting, totally. a, you're get cause you, his tape both from last year, even though he didn't play as much last year when he played and the year before that, when, when he was a full-time starter, his tape's good. You're going to like him. Um, and again, he's your fourth best corner on this, this roster. <laughs> so I would, so, okay. So take a look at the entire, uh, group, uh, defensive side. You got a new uh, defensive coordinator and head coach, Mike McDonald and, mm -hmm. uh, new, uh, defensive line guy, the guy from Dallas, you've got, uh, the same defensive back coach and Carl Scott linebackers coach is going to be new. Tell me how we improved looking at the roster. Tell me how we're going to be a better defense um, than we were last year. Or a smarter coached defense um, with a group of people that do, do a significantly better job than Clint Hurt ever did at playing to his strengths and putting guys in position to be successful. Um, and that helps quite a bit. I think you get more out of the talent you have. I think you are better at safety. Um, and you are functionally much, better. You're, yeah. you're, you're more diverse in the secondary at, and it's at safety. So you're more, um, scheme and, and the ability to disguise things is going to be better. And at linebacker, you're uh, a little faster and better in coverage. So, Plus you've gotten a nose tackle, which you didn't have last year. Um, I think it's just, there's a lot more balance to the defense all over. Um, there's still talent um, in a lot of key places. And I think it, it you've got a better coaching staff um, on the defensive side of the ball. So Where's I, your biggest hole? my right. biggest hole right Heading now, into the draft. probably middle linebacker still. Uh, maybe nose tackle because I'm not convinced that Hankins is going to um, come in and be the guy that we want him to be from three years ago. Um, but middle linebacker, mainly just because I think they need, they need someone who's actually a long-term solution there. Both guys are, they're fill-in players um, who, ha who they're the, 
of the right style that McDonald wants, but maybe not the same quality. So um, could you see a guy like John Schneider after dropping back? I don't think he would do it at 16. I, at least I hope not. After dropping back at, from 16, and say you drop back a couple times, you're now in the, the mid to late 20s. And could you see him pulling a, a surprise um, linebacker choice in this in this draft? Yeah. If um, Edger and Cooper, Edger and Cooper uh, is the guy who I was thinking about. Yeah. Um, God, we, we play, picking him up in the twenties. I think it's a little overdrafting him. I um, totally agree. But you know, maybe you drop back again. Maybe intrigued by you, Payson, Payson, uh, Peyton Wilson's speed and athleticism um, mm -hmm. could be very intriguing to a guy like Schneider. I could see that, and especially if Mike McDonald. Especially if they I move back, and like they're, they're sitting at like defense. twenty-seven after dropping back a couple of times, um, and then you, It'd you still grab be an Peyton overdraft. Wilson. It'd still it be would an be, but it wouldn't be that much of an overdraft. And you're talking about a guy that you stick in there, and um, he just becomes the center. Uh, he becomes the very middle of your defense. Um, yeah. I, I think that would be. Uh, I would be a little concerned about Peyton Wilson's injury stuff, but the high ceiling yeah, type, type stuff is very intriguing there. I, it would, uh, that would be one of the disappointments I think for me, if, if Schneider decided to draft a, a middle linebacker mm -hmm. with our first pick overall after dropping. I'm back. more, I'm more thinking that that's going to be the, the pick in the eighties um, when they have a chance, you know what I mean? Like in, in that, so they're going to I'll move back a couple times and fill some other needs. And then when they got mm -hmm. a pick in, in the eighties or one Oh two, you know, and to go find a guy in that spot, whether it be um, Teron Hopper, Trevor, or, Trotter, Cedric or, gray, or I can, I don't think they draft I but, Trevon Trevon Wallace would be a guy that that could be interesting to them, like two hundred and forty pound guy, more of a traditional guy, but it's a lot of very athletic. Yeah, um, they even like the you know the kid from Washington. I don't, I wouldn't want to dismiss that guy. Ola Foscio, um, could be an interesting pick. He's very familiar, obviously, and so yeah, yeah. or Michael Curtis Barrett Jacobs. Um, out of Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, How about another position on the on the defense that looks weak on paper? Yeah, the other one it's still nose tackle. Uh, I said I know they've got three guys, which is three more than they had last <laughs> year, but just quality is is my concern. Um, but go look at at the, in the draft after Tavondre Sweat. How far do you have to drop before you hit the next nose tackle? Yeah, fourth round. Yeah, I know. Round? I'm. I mean, true, true nose tackle. I mean, um, McKinley Jackson, Jordan Jefferson. Um, sheesh, after, man, it's it's tough. It's tough going. I'll it's be a honest. long it's tough going. way. There's just not that guy in the draft, which is why I think that um, a guy like Trevondre Sweat could actually be in play in the first round for mm, the Seahawks if they oh, move back. Man. Now, see. That's where the, the discussion comes in. If you're John Schneider, listen, listen I've got 20, 20 first round grades, um, 20 players with first round grades. After that, I've got, you know, everything from pick 25 to 50 is an equal grade or varying mm -hmm. degrees of equal, depending on the position group. That's where you could make the argument that Trevandre Sweat could be the guy if he's equal value but positional need drives them to to make that selection more than best well, player on the board it's more than just positional need it's positional value uh, if he's the only the only true nose tackle in the first two rounds of the draft and so you're looking at maybe even the first three rounds of the draft um you're looking at you either get him or you don't get someone who you can trust this year. 
Mm. You have to overdraft for that if you want it. Yeah, I hate that. I hate the idea of that. You know, it's it's sometimes you just have to accept that you're not going to get the guy that you need in in that particular year, and you just yeah, you move on. You get the best player available, the best. A guy well, that's that what the draft the hedges job. are supposed to do. That's what Jonathan Hankins does. Is it means that yeah. if they don't get him, they're not. Well, screwed. what I'm saying is, you end up get drafting a guy like Dwayne Carter at 302 pounds, or Leonard Taylor at 303, or Mason Smith at 306 pounds, and you just you you take what you can get out of those players in year one. Maybe they they change their bodies a little bit in year two or whatever, and they develop, or you just approach the position again in the off season. Um, and and you go address other positions of need to make your overall roster better, but that that position group just kind of is what it is. That that season now they've done that before, and they did that last year. In fact, the last couple of years, a defensive tackle by just completely blowing it off. Mm-hmm. So anyhow, <clears throat> um, one thing that we haven't um, really we didn't mention with this is, yeah, they went and and they they upgraded some safety. And they went uh, um, cheaper, um, but I don't know if that stops them from going and drafting uh, Cooper DeJean to be mm-hmm. that guy who can do everything in your secondary as safety slash cornerback slash superstar, and uh, you know mm-hmm. Kyle Hamilton uh, in Baltimore mm-hmm. that role. And especially if you move back off 16 and you're sitting there at 24 and then you draft that guy. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that much scheme diversity. That's act. That's a playmaker. um, mm -hmm. First, probably a a legit first round grade on a guy like that. Um, Now he's, he's positionally. I think he he suffers a little bit against guys like Rake Straw or McKinstry or Wiggins, Quinny and Mitchell, T- Terry and Arnold. He's right there, but he's he plays in a spot that I think is going to be less valued than than those other guys. Those are boundary guys. Those are going to be, you know, your playmakers on the back end. Cooper Jean's going to be more of a guy that's going to play closer to the line of scrimmage and be your jack of all trades athlete on defense. Yeah, and I don't know why, but those guys tend to fall out of favor because they don't have a true, true position, you know, in the NFL. Yeah. But look at how much of a difference guys like Buda Baker have made. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Kyle Hamilton. I mean, yeah. you don't have to go any further than that. Yeah. I mean, the, the, there is value there. And that's why I think that, um, man, defensive back just in general, especially a guy who's listed at, at corner. Um, that's not a need, not in right. any way. Um, right. but to, to right. get the, that long-term safety, you know, Julian loves only got a and, couple and years a left and, 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 and yeah. And just such as like, honestly, at, on defense, because, uh, matching need and, and talent and, and, um, the draft class that makes the most sense of any, uh, first round pick to me. Well, it kind of bumps, uh, Kayvon Wallace off of that third spot. And you you put Cooper DeGene in there to pair with Rashawn Jenkins and Julian Love, yeah. And that's a heck of a trifecta at safety. And yeah, and, uh, when one and to of those go with the corners is, you've already got, yeah. Um, so you got Devin Witherspoon and um, Cooper DeGene be your your main guys that you yeah. can move around all over the place. Like those are your superstars. Like yeah, yeah. Uh, Fun and. That's to me, I, I look at, at that combination and I go, yeah, that's, that's how you build a championship level defense. But I will say this, it's harder it, as you build a roster, it's harder to get those guys at, at, at you know, defensive end, outside linebacker and the edge rusher at, at three tech or a, a nose tackle that affects your roster, like to pay those guys in free agency mm-hmm. versus getting a guy like DeGene you know, later on. Um, yeah, but you know. just, you, you just paid Williams, right? So you've got that. You just drafted and developed, um, Monet, uh, not Monet, uh, Moffe. 
um, at the pass. You know what I mean? You've so you've got Drew Mount Jones too. Yeah. I mean, um, you've got guys at those other positions. Um, I mean, I could see That's it. True. I could That's see true. it. Um, yeah, no, I could, I could see darn near any, you can make an argument for almost any position to draft. Yeah. Even if you're loaded at one spot, they draft a wide. I'd be shocked if they drafted a wide receiver at 16 um, or at 22 or whatever, <coughs> but I could see it because of what we talked about with uh, Tyler Lockett. You know, you could see him drafting a quarterback, even though we've got a couple of quarterbacks on the roster. Um, hopefully not a running back. Um, but you could see him drafting a tight end early, potentially to pair with Noah Fant to really make it that, that offense explosive. Um, to just go out, score people. Um, so that would be interesting. You could definitely make the argument for interior offensive line. I don't think there's any question there. Uh, and then on the defense, I think we ended up doing a really good job. You got to take it, um, to John Schneider as far as just doing a good job, building the roster in the off season, making the moves contractually, uh, and the salary cap that we needed to make in order to get right again, give us the best opportunity to. Uh, go into the future with and then kind of making the roster starting to make the roster in Mike McDonald's um, scheme image. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's exciting. It's a, it's a fun time. It's, it's very interesting to me what they will do in the draft, how, what the strategy is, um, whether they accumulate picks, whether they stick and pick, um, whether they got to have a hard time seeing them sticking and picking and then not picking anyone until um, the eighties. Mm hmm. And then there's quite a, quite a difference too. I can't remember where our picks are right off the top of my head, but there's a big shelf as well between like 180 and 130, whenever mm -hmm. we pick in there too. So I don't think we have a fifth round pick at all. Yep. So it's, you know, I, I do see them moving around. I just don't know how they're going to do it. Are they going to do future picks? Are they going to do a player trade? Are they going to drop back from 16 to 26 and, try to get three additional picks out of that uh, because they they feel like they they need to have a more well-rounded roster overall as far as depth or are they going to go take a swing at a blue chip player at 16 or move up even to to get a quarterback fascinating all right yeah that's it that's our roster yeah. so now it only makes sense to do another mock draft oh hell yes so let's make that our next show <laughs> and uh, put all this, all this knowledge uh, into play uh, and, and have it work for us on, on mock draft. So we'll figure out the rules. I'll break them. I'll come in with my show <laughs> and, and Keith just has to put up with it. Yep. Right. Yep. That's what okay. we do. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Find Keith on Twitter at Myers NFL. You can find me at NWC Hawk. The show is Seahawks playbook podcast on our own YouTube channel and your favorite podcast platform and hit the subscribe button. So until next time, go Hawks. Go Hawks. Seahawks Playbook Podcast listeners, thanks for joining us for another edition of the show. You can find us on Twitter. Bill is at NW Seahawk. Keith is at Myers NFL. And the show is at Hawks Playbook. You can listen and subscribe to the show at SeahawksPlaybook.com.